Yo, yo, what's up, guys? Your boy Keelan Jazz here. Welcome back to another video. Today, we're going to be reading Logos and Arrows to the Divine Synergy, starting off with the Logos Theory. The word for word, order, language, and rationality refer to the word Logos. The word Logos has its origin in Greek. This is something I could go on and on about. The English equivalents in the Liddell, Scott, and Bridge Greek English Dictionary are about five pages long. It's essentially a term that needs to be used in the original language because any English translation falls short. The most famous example of this, in my opinion, is the first line of St. John's Gospel, which is translated at the beginning, the word was God. I've been a Christian since I was baptized, and I've never fully grasped what this that entails, because I couldn't read or comprehend the Gospel. In Greek, however, it is written in Logos. In the beginning, there was Logos. To put it in another way, everything started out with order. This is a bold assertion. It may seem self-evident, but it isn't. And we're talking about a thousand years of the world's best and brightest debating and pondering what this means. For example, Greek thought began with Homer and continued with Hesiod, the Iliad, and the Odyssey stories which are essentially superhero comic books with people fighting each other and making speeches, as well as gods fighting each other and making speeches. We're told by Homer. In the eyes of his contemporaries in the Hesiod, the Hesiod then decided to take it a step further, but he did decide to write a book about the beginning of everything. It was titled The God's Birth and was about the birth of the gods. As he had stated at the outset, everything was in disarray. So if you combine those two points, you're talking about something like 1,000 years, maybe a century or two, beginning with the attempt to comprehend man, the world he lived in, and realizing that it was complicated. But there was a pattern, and you could talk about it because your mind could understand it, and with that, the conversation came to an end. It went from saying there was chaos in the beginning, to St. John saying there was order in the beginning. So as I previously stated, there was logos everywhere. This has been a long, arduous battle that began when the first man, Adam, spoke to the first other person, which was believed was a woman named Eve, because logos is speech in its most basic form. Humans are only the creatures, or only the cre only the only creatures who can communicate with one another, and this is the beginning of this massive cosmic process. So that the, by the time of Christianity, you have a firm grasp of the fact that history has meaning and purpose. It was given to Christianity by both the Hebrews and the Greeks. The Greeks had a philosophy unrelated to history, and the Hebrews had a history unrelated to philosophy. When Christianity arrived, they came together. For the first time, you get the impression that Logos has a past and that we can understand all of human history. You might want to start with Adam. In some ways, man is now on his own. He's not in the Garden of Eden anymore. He'll have to put, on, put forth a significant amount of effort. He's in a hostile environment. His intellect has been dulled, but no matter where he looks, he can still see the order of the universe. In every single group, and we say this because of anthropology's breakthroughs in the late 19th century, the disciple dis disciplines golden age. Every group believes that the universe is origin in some way. They usually have a word for it, and it has to do with, with God. But they have no idea how to say it. As a, result, as a result, people all over the world were attempting to reach an understanding. The Greeks appeared to have gone further than anyone else for reasons that I don't understand. It's all part of ma God's master plan. It did not develop in China, even though they had a sense of it. In a sense, the Tao is a Logos sense. When the Jesuit missionaries arrived in China, they decided to talk about it. In a translation of St. John's Gospel, he says that there was Tao at the beginning which makes more sense than there was word in the beginning. As far as I'm aware, nothing happened in that location as well. The Jesuits were hopeful at first, but eventually gave up. Uh, it appeared to be hopeless. It just didn't see, get off the ground. It did, however, flourish among the Greeks of Ionia on Persian's western coast. They both started out as physicists, and basically you had a form of materialism here because they believe that the universe, the order of the universe, could be simply reduced to some physical principle. Heraclitus, 
lived 500 years before St. John arrived in Ephesus and claimed that fire was the original principle. It was also a Greek colony at the time and basically the Persian Empire. And of course, fire is a significant in Zoroastrianism, a pagan religion. So you can see why it's significant because it's why it's significant because it's a form of energy and we do believe that energy is the foundation of everything in many ways. He also mentioned logos and fire, implying that fire is logos in action. That's a big step in the right direction, but it came to a halt at this point because they lacked the necessary instruments to advance physics and further uh, and until Galileo invented the telescope and Robert Hooke visualized a microorganism, no one would have had the instruments. Then came another great, le great leap forward in our understanding of the physical world which culminated in the 19th century with the rise of materialism and the development of extremely sophisticated instruments to discover the ultimate material of the universe. However, the Greeks gave up at that point because they couldn't go any further. As a result, the entire concept of logo shifted at this point and become a, became a primarily a matter of legal debate. They were referred to as sophists and Socrates became fascinated um, Socrates became fascinated by sophistry to use a word he didn't like but the debates the legal debates in this office and whether you could have a basis for something other than simply winning the case in court and this led to Socrates Plato and Socrates all asking what just was and what the difference was between all of um, all of this and it was at this point that Plato began writing his dialogues and we progressed then there was Aristotle who was Plato's student in a sense Aristotle returned to his physics roots <clears throat> but because he wrote a book called the metaphysics he was able to do it in a manner much more sophisticated in a much more sophisticated manner metaphysics on the other hand was essentially the science of being as science of being as being and he could base it as Permenides, who said things like, that which cannot come from, that which is not, which is a profound statement, as well as the foundation for future metaphysics and ontology. However, everything came crashing down at this point with Aristotle, who happened to be Alexander the Great's tutor. The entire philosophical project came to a halt, and at that point, history begins a new era. Because philosophy is no longer relevant, Obviously, some people continue to do so, but the Academy in Athens continues for another 800 years or so. However, there are, have been, been no significant philosophical breakthroughs, but you have Alexander spreading Greek conquering the world and spreading Greek throughout the world. But in terms of God, we're at a crossroads. There was Aristotle who claimed that there was an unmoved mover and an uncaused cause and an unmoved mover. We can arrive at this conclusion through natural means. He undoubtedly arrived at it through natural means. You can also show that there is a God. It is obvious that you can now by natural reason because he did. There is a deity. You have no way of knowing whether he is considered concerned about you, right? And there's a good chance he doesn't. Why should he after all? Why do you need anyone else if you're already perfect? And that, in a nutshell, was Aristotle's God. That did not sit well with Plato. In this approach, Plato was more humanistic, less scientific and more humanistic, and he came up with a demiurge, a people's worker. God was the people's laborer, and he was concerned about you. He wasn't transcended, however, because he worked for the people. As a result, you were caught in a bind, and that was the end of it. Essentially, you had two visions of God that were at odds with one another. No one was able to find a solution, and that was the end of it. That's the way it was when we left it. That was the way philosoph philosophy used to, to be, and Alexander was uninterested in spreading it throughout moving philosophy. He had no desire to rule the entire world, and he was doing it so in, according to God's will. So you have both of these things going on at the same time. Locus's development up to a certain point, and then failure, and Alexander was uninterested in spreading the philosophy movement. 
God can use someone like Alexander to spread this concept even if it isn't perfect. So St. John is in Ephesus 500 years after Heraclitus. St. John is the one who has received this new message. There's a whole new story to tell. It's none other than the Jesus Christ. They're also at odds with the Jews. The Gospel of St. John was written by him as well as, as Ephesus. In the Gospel, the Jews are the adversary. They are with a, without a doubt the enemies of the Gospel. They're making it difficult for people like him to spread the Gospel. But more importantly, they are preventing people like St. Paul from sharing the Gospel with others. Ephesus is also home to St. Paul. He penned a letter to the Ephesians. He was speaking to a city founded on silversmiths and dedicated to Diana. The fertility goddess and the silversmith walked away with a large sum of money. They didn't want anyone interfering with their religion because it was their source of income. Um, lasting impression on Paul. Then Paul is abruptly expelled from the synagogue and then it hits him. He's been summoned to preach to the Greeks and he eventually arrives in Athens. This is recorded in Acts of the Apostles and as he walks through the town he notices all of the temples and he decides to address an elite group known as Eropagus. These are philosophers after all, and who am I to say this in my humble opinion? I believe he made a rhetorical error by assuming he was speaking to Ephesians who worshipped silver idols. And this was not the case with these individuals, they were philosophers to be sure. They know that if they knew Plato and Aristotle, they wouldn't be able to reduce this to a small statue. They were well aware of this. So why is he discussing idols with them? It was incorrect. It was the incorrect group of individuals then, after the usual story here. He rushed in to spread the gospel. Uh, I'm about to tell you a story about Jesus Christ. His father was Joseph and the genealogy all the way back to Adam. These people, on the other hand, have no idea who these Hebrew men were. They are unconcerned. He'll have to find a new way to deal with it. As a result, he sort of blurts out to the Athenians, he cares about you, this man, and then he rose from the grave. First and foremost, who is this man? Second, what exactly do you mean he was resurrected from the dead? So they say, wow, that's intriguing. Except for two people. They walked out saying, we'll talk about this another time. As a result, he failed. And I believe John was well aware that he had failed. In light of that failure, I believe John wrote the Gospel of St. John. It isn't the genealogy of Jesus because we are at the new beginning. The genealogy of Jesus, on the other hand, is of no interest to the Greeks. The new beginning is a Greek philosophy, which they are familiar with. So in many ways, I believe that St. John's Gospel is the speech that St. Paul should have given. Um, I believe they were both emphasized. They were both aware of the problem. Letters were exchanged back and forth. There were letters to the Ephesians and other places, the Apostles, Acts, and so forth. So I believe it was deliberate, but at Saint John, as Saint Saint John points out, there was logos in the beginning, which I believe would catch their attention, because hey, I'm speaking to their language. I'm referring to logos. Do you know what the word logos means? Now I'm speaking in Greek. You're Greeks, right? I'm referring to the Greek language. There's no more of this Hebrew nonsense. I'm speaking to you in your native tongue. In some ways, he had an advantage because when he said at the start that there was logos. They knew that he was talking about whereas we didn't. When we read in the beginning was the word, I have no idea what that means. However, when there was logos in the beginning, I know what you're talking about. They say, Heraclitus talked about it and God was accompanied by logos. First and foremost, there was logos in the beginning, which is a direct reference to the first verse of Genesis which states that God created heaven and earth in the beginning. As a result, this is similar to New Genesis, and this New Genesis falls under the umbrella of Greek philosophy. As a result, God understands and in many ways approves of your efforts. That, exactly what, that is exactly what God is implying. That is what St. John is attempting to convey through the, writings, the writing in Greek. As a result, Logos was present with God. What exactly does that imply? The following sentence reads, Logos was God. That adds a whole new level of complexity. Philosophical, philosophical debate, a philosophical debate that has been stalled for more than 300 years. What you're saying now is that the Trinity is what, you, what he's talking about, right? 
in what he's saying, he's implying we'll need centuries to fully comprehend the implication of these three sentences. But there, the, but there, they're implicitly and by the Trinity, you're implying that there are three persons and one God, all of whom are co-eternal and they've always existed because God necessitates constant existence. God the Father, on the other hand, did not create God the Son. God the Son would be a thing he created him if he created him, and because the Demiurge was created by another Demiurge, he cannot be the Demiurge. The Logos, according to Philo, was created right. There are heresies all over the place now. It's a miracle that we survived all of these heresies, but basically you're saying God begot the Son, and as a result, he's on the same level. He's a God as well, but he's not suddenly like the others. As a result, you suddenly have both transcendence and immanence. That takes care of the issue and it forms that beginning that the spirit that flows through the earth arises. So that's the closest and as a result there is a slew of incredible implications here. First and foremost there is this is the ultimate reality. So put water out of your mind, forget about your little balls colliding with each other as Democrats suggested atoms of emptiness. According to our scientists is scientists is the ultimate reality. However, Logos is a real person. God is Logos. People won't be able to do it for centuries. Literally centuries. The magnitude of this statement can be grasped by philosophers, and precisely because everyone was interested in the theology. The magnitude of the Christian revelation was so stunning and powerful that it effectively paralyzed philosophy for centuries. And then there was Augustine, who was a well-educated man who worked as a journalist. He was a rhetorician, rhetorician by profession. In terms of scripture, he wasn't as well versed as St. Jerome. Okay, he on the other hand saw the bigger picture. He saw the big picture and he tried it because he wanted to be a Platonist. He decided to do free leisure, so he decided to devote himself to go on a retreat, become Platonist, and rise to, the compl to contemplate being. But it doesn't work. Then he realizes that he doesn't have to do it any longer because the fact that he can't rise to the level of the divine isn't necessary, necessary any longer because the divine has descended into human history. And as a result, it's a completely different ballgame in a variety of ways. Augustine was the first man to understand time, according to Christopher Dawson. And there's some truth to that. As a result of God's descent into history, history now has a reason to exist. With Plato and Aristotle, it never served a purpose. It was always kind of geometry. When the Greeks talked about Logos, it's a fixed system, a static system of eternal relationships. In other words, to some extent, it is, be it is, but it is also a moving relationship because it exists in time, and then you're faced with the same problem that Parmenides and Heraclitus couldn't solve because the only opposite of being is nothing, and nothing can form from nothing. Parmenides put it, if everything is being, then nothing comes into being. As a result, nothing can change. The entire materialistic order must be essentially static and possess the best qualities of being so. The tr Trinity solving some, some of those problems of ancient philosophy situates the Logos in the Godhead himself, as opposed to the Logos being some other demiurge or emanation of another god. The Trinity paved the way for modern science. Laplatinus became involved in the phenomenon of em emanations, and whenever you have an emanation problem, you are first and foremost imposing necessity on God, which you cannot do. God acts out of love and freedom, and emanations are necessary. That's the only way you'll be able to do it. However, you're also participating in the infinite regress, which as Aristotle claimed was impossible. So it's an emanation of what you're trying to do, accomplish, similar to what the Demiurge attempted, and there's the world of motion. And then there's the God of Eternity. However, Platonists attempt to fill the void through emanations, which are essentially something that will fill the gap. As though well, there is an emanation. There's also an emanation that comes forth from an emanation, and so forth. Platonists discuss this sort of thing. However, it isn't required because the Logos is incarnate. It is not required, and so once you have the incarnation, you have Logos in in creation in a way that you cannot understand before. Once you've created Logos, you've solved the problem. Aquinas would call this secondary 
secondary cash causality causality once you have secondary causality you have the possibility of science now one group that did not get the right this right was islam and again we have a situation when there are people who are obviously bright people especially if you're talking about the persians a lot of these islamic philosophers philosophers were persian they have an ancient culture they have all of the advantages and yet it stops development of logo stops and why does it stop well, because they don't have the trinity. Islam developed out of historianism, which developed out of a lot of different things. But historianism cannot understand the trinity. So in other words, you had all of these heresies that God is a man, but he's not. Or he's God, but he's not a man. And it took centuries before the camel with the formula of true God and true man. If you don't have that connection, there is no secondary causality. If you don't have secondary causality, God creates everything directly. In order to know anything about the physical world, you have to know about the mind of God. Well, you can't know the mind of God because your mind is incapable of that. You might be able to grasp if God reveals himself to you as he did with the Trinity. You can ponder that and come up with some of the implications, but first of all, you can never figure it out on your own. And secondly, you don't have the mind of God. You're incapable of doing it. So stating that the case for the Muslim, God is like the Caliph who goes for a ride in his carriage in the afternoon and when he gets to the gates of this property he doesn't know whether he's going to make a right turn or a left turn well there's not much to go on because well you're saying God is pure will and if he doesn't know whether he's going to turn right or turn left so if everything is dependent on knowing the mind of God well we're in trouble because God doesn't know either and so as a result this movement science did not develop in the Islamic world so you had bright people constantly running around on seeds falling on barren ground. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their hearts. This is the seed sown along the path. Being Islam, you also have the conflict be between Islam and Persia, which has never been resolved. To this day, Shia Islam is a protest movement against the Arab conquest of Persians. You've got a religion that is holding back the Persian mind, and I think it's held back the Persian mind for a millennium now. So again, at this point, we have to make clear that if you want to develop intellectually, you have to understand the Trinity. Now, that's not fair because what you're saying is it's revelation. Well, yeah, you're right. It is revelation. But the revelation has been revealed. And once it's revealed, to either you get with the program or you condemn yourself to isolation and stagnation and absurdity. Now, I'm talking about what happened to India, what happened to China, and what happened in the Islamic world. All high civilizations, to some extent, all of which stalled because they didn't have the proper understanding of Logos, which now, after the arrival of Christ, involves the Trinity. Either you get right, get that right, or you don't develop it. That's simple. So you've gotten an absolutely trans transcendent God who is imminent and at the same time, not at all, but concerned about you, concerned about your well-being. Uh, that's really something to chew on. Uh, and people have been chewing on it for two millennium, millennia now. And not, they're not going to exhaust it by that. What I'm saying here is that... The path of Logos is that it's developed out of history. It's like a train. If you're not at the station at the right time, the train will leave without you. The train is the movement of Logos in history. Victor Emil Frankl developed a Logotherapy theory which described the search for meaning as the basis of human driving force in his book, Man's Search for Meaning. He defines logos as a Greek word that indicates meaning. Logos therapy, also known as the third Viennese school of psychotherapy, is a psych psychotherapy that focuses on the meaning of human existence and man's search for it. Man's primary motivator, according to logos, is his desire to find meaning in his life. That is why, in contrast to the pleasure principle, or as we call it, the will to pleasure at the heart of Freudian psychoanalysis and the will to power at the heart of Adlerian psychology was referred to as striving for superiority, I speak of a will to meaning. Man's search for meaning is the primary motivation in his life and a secondary rationalization of instinctual drives. This means this, this meaning is unique and specific in that it must and can be fully fulfilled by him alone. And only then does it achieve a significance that will satisfy his own will to meaning. 
Some authors contend that meanings and values are nothing but defense mechanisms, reactions, formations, and sublimations. But as for Viktor Frankl, he would not be willing to live merely by for the sake of defense mechanisms, nor would he be ready to die for the sake of reaction formations. Man, however, can live and even die for the sake of his ideals and values. The ability to bring order out of chaos, but also to bring disorder out of pathological order, the human potential for consciousness, communication, and awareness is known as Logos. It is a necessary condition for being itself. It is the deepest idea of the West and the biblical narrative that there can be no being without consciousness. Christ is frequently shown as a social reformer similar to Moses. According to Richard Horsley, Jesus advocated a social revolution, a transformation of community life from the ground up. Rather than a political revolution, the Galilee dominated colonial like class struggle during Jesus' ministry with tension and conflict between the urban ruling elite and the economically oppressed peasants. As a result, a spiral of violence developed with oppression leading to protests, led to more repression, and finally revolt. In this context, Jesus acted as a social prophet, visiting the poor of the countryside and preaching a new social order. He acted advocated for a social society free of hierarchy and patriarchy. He blessed the poor while chastising the wealthy. People should love their neighbors, turn the other cheek, forgive debts, and return stolen land, according to him. Richard Horsley and Jordan Peterson's portrait of Jesus as a social revolutionary portrays him as working for a social transformation of community life. The weakness of Horsley's view is its failure to account it satisfactorily for the spiritual and eschatological dimensions of Jesus' preaching. The evidence is strong that Jesus called for repentance and spiritual renewal. With politics and religion closely intertwined in first century Israel, Jesus proclaimed of a new social order would surely have been heard as having both religious and social implications. R. David Kaler draws on Horsley's work affirming Jesus' social and political agenda but emphasizes more strongly that Jesus was calling Israel back to his covenant obligations. When we speak in such terms as covenant, and it's important to note the biblical connotation of what it proceeds to be, Job had imagined that a covenant was a legal matter and that anyone who was a party to a contract could insist on his rights as agreed, that God would be faithful and true or at least just. And as one could assume from the Ten Commandments, would have some recognition of ethical values or at least feel committed to his own legal standpoint. However, God lacks the human limitation of mortality. What does man possess that God does not? Because of his littleness, puniness, and defenselessness against the Almighty, he presents, as already suggested, a somewhat keener consciousness based on self-reflection. He must, in order to survive, always be mindful of his impotence, because human beings are always at the mercy of their mortality, they need to introspect in order to avoid suffering and death. They remained unconscious of what was causing them the pain they would surely die. Therefore, there is transition, transcendent purpose to every tr event in our lives. Moses stood up to Egypt Egyptian oppression in the same way that Christ stood up to Pharisees and scribes, tyranny. As a result of confronting oppression, Moses created chaos. The crossing in water was the first source of chaos. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Moses was a master of water, which is a sign of, which is a sign of disorder. But after he re realized the Hebrews from Egyptian, the he after he released the Hebrews from the Egyptian rule, they went through a 40-year period of near complete anarchy, desert abandonment, moral turmoil, and lack of direction and purpose. Jesus answered very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless you are born of water and the spirit. John 3 verse 5, the hero is someone who brings, in, who brings order out of chaos. But sometimes the hero is something who, someone who brings intermediary chaos out of a despotic order. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will will become in them as a spring of water willing up to eternal life. John 4, 14. 
Rather than creating order out of disorder or chaos out of order, think of Logos as a force that keeps order and chaos in check. Depending on the situation, the Logos performs one of these primary functions. Because there is lots of anarchy, but as a much of ty- much of tyranny, it frequently creates out of order out of chaos. With the hero, the sp- with the hero, the person who represents Logos, struggling to replace the tyrant mona- monarch. It is engaging in a game that is more mutual and well negotiated. Christianity assumes that the thing that Christ is the, that is Christ is the message of God that brings order out of chaos and at the beginning of time. They are the same. You are the thing that creates order from chaos if you properly represent the everlasting spirit. You are the transformative agent who sits in the midst of chaos at the start of existence. Rather than the start of the cosmos, the Christian realized that the Logos is closely linked to the express truth. See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. John 5.14 Because the West is just that. It will die without the rebirth of the Logos. Once it's gone, it's gone. And we've seen the alternatives. There are two types of fascism. Fascism and communism. There is also the whole new age of shambles. It doesn't make take much digging beneath the surface to see most of people's lives uh, deep to dig beneath the surface of most people's lives to uncover something truly tragic almost everyone has at least one truly terrible flaw because people are cons- constantly surrounded by a tra- tragic sense of being most people believe they are capable of much more and are acutely aware of their flaws they do not believe they are what they should be you know, you're going to die, so you have to constantly work and sacrifice the pleasures of the present for the sake of the future. My father is always at his work to do this very day, and I too am working. John 5, verse 17. How can anyone be truly truer than that when you have all that weight on your shoulders? If you read Alexander Isovich Solzhenitsyn, you'll wonder why the Soviet Union developed into the absolute hellhole it was. It's because everyone lied. According to Solzhenitsyn, uh, then you may inquire about Sigmund Freud and consider repression as the primary cause of mental illness. That's a lie. But it's a more of a lie by omission or internet intentional sin than a lie by commission. It makes no difference. It's still lying. Carl Jung echoes the sentiment. Wouldn't it be fascinating if the lie was the root of all psychopathic? If the lie was the root of all psychopathology, the lie is at the heart of political psychopathology, what if that's exactly what's destroying your life? People believe that the universe is an unfair, arbitrary place, bent on their random destruction while they suffer, especially when they are nihilistic and destructive. What would you do in this situation? That is the question. One possible answer is to twist the thing to get what you want out of it, hypothetically, the other option is to rely on your perceptions and ability to accurately represent them. Communicate this and take chances. That is for the struggle between the forces of good and evil. There is no consciousness without the ability to distinguish between opposites. Carl Jung says, This is the paternal principle of the Logos, which is always trying to break free from the primal warmth, in other words, from unconsciousness. Divine desire to be born is unafraid of suffering, conflict or sin the primary sin according to logos is unconsciousness which is the source of all evil as a result matricide is at its first creative act of liberation and the motivating factor that dared all heights and depths must suffer the divine punishments of enslavement on the caucus rocks according to Synesius. nothing in it can exist without its polar opposite there were once in all one and will be again. Consciousness can only exist if the unconsciousness is recognized on a regular basis, just as everything that lives must die many times. John Milton's Paradise Lost is considered one of the greatest literary works of the last 500 years. Here's how Milton went about it. Milton claimed that he was attempting to justify God's actions to man. That was his goal, and he was attempting to look at the world as it was with all of its suffering malice and corruption. He wanted to show why it was still acceptable. So he conducted the first psychoanalytical study of evil and malevolence. 
there is a sense of heaven and hell around the bodies of biblical writings. There's this idea that there's a conflict between the I rational mind's political, ideological, and rational constructions. The highest angel in God's heavenly kingdom, Satan, is a personification of the rational mind's tendency to investigate total totalitarianism systems falling, before falling in love with them. This was turned into a great poetic drama by Milton. He hypothesized that the spiritual element of the psyche that characterized the rational mind would end up casting itself into hell and as a result of its proclivity to produce these totalita totalitizing systems, because the poets arrived before the philosophers, you can think of it as foreshadowing of what was to become in the centuries of Milton wrote. The poets arrived be before the artists. Poets are those who have the most foresight into what is to come down the road. A crazy person's first step is to re refuse to participate in the lie. The world is weighed down by a single word of truth. The traditional approach of the church throughout the age has been to treat the Bible as inspired word of the God and the Gospels as historically reliable accounts of the life of Jesus. This perspective began to be seriously challenged during the period of European history known as Enlightenment, 17th and 18th mm -hmm. century. When the philosophy of rationalism, rationalism dominated the intellectual scene, philosophical rationalism claimed that, re re that reason, what can be logically understood by the mind, was the sole test of truth. Anything that could not be rationally explained was not true. Supernatural elements in the Bible were viewed with skepticism or disbelief. Historical criticism began to be applied to the biblical text to study them like any other historical documents. John Piaget's ultimate goal was to bring science and religion together. Assimilation and accommodation are merely a circularized version of the logos. Nothing can come to a profound Nothing com comes out of nowhere, and even the most profound ideas have a long history. The concept of the Logos is similar to its description of the human psyche as an active agent in the face of what it doesn't comprehend. It is kind of potential in that active confrontation of what it doesn't understand, a potential form on which knowledge emerges, requiring it to give up old structures to create new ones. It is portrayed imagistically and dramatically in the ancient concept of Christ dying and rising again. There's a well-articulated Christian idea that you should identify with the dying and resurrecting God. And part of what that means psychologically is letting go of old dead structures and allowing something new to emerge. So you might think that the ideologue's mistake is to identify himself or herself with the, what they already are, and then try to make that total. That is a totalitarian inclination. If you only identify with what you are, you must follow the totalitarian impulse. Because if you are willing to let go of who you are to become who you can be, you can identify with the painful, changing part of yourself. It turns out that it isn't as painful as the alternative. John Piaget, who was deeply influenced by these ideas, was able to express it in the concept of assimilation and accommodation. He saw, it as, as, saw that as the driving force beyond, behind tra stage transitions, and also believed in Thomas Kuhn's concept of a paradigm shift, so there are no unjustified leaps here. He has largely laid the groundwork for that, but he has also come to a halt around formal operations, which are arguably late adolescent and early adulthood. The Logos remains an impersonal force in Greek philosophy, a lifeless and abstract philosophical concept that is a necessary postulate for the universe's cause of order and purpose. The Logos is personal in Hebrew thought. He does have the ability to bring unity, coercion, cohesion, coherence, and purpose to the world, but the biblical Logos is a he, not it. All attempts to translate the word Logos have been insuffic insufficient in some way. The fullness of St. John's Logos when he declared that the word became flesh and dwelt among us is impossible to express in English. Philosoph philosophers have attempted to translate Logos as logic act or deed, but these are all inadequate definitions. Action is a part of God's Logos. The Logos is living embodiment of the eternal word. It is not, however, an irrational action or a pure expression of emotion. In St. John's Gospel, the divine actor is announced who acts coherently in creation and redemption. The startling conclusion of, Saint, of 
John 1, is that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Our humanity is invaded by the cosmic Christ. It is the pinnacle of the eternal encounter with the temporal, the infinite encounter with the finite, and the unconditioned encounter with the conditioned. Reflect on this truth. God became flesh to accomplish your redemption. Have you accepted his gift of salvation? John 1 verse 1 In the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. John 1 verse 15 John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, this was he of whom I said, He who comes out after him is preferred before me. He was before me. And that concludes the first um, 